really necessary. <laughs> Can't get away from it. Turn. Okay. You folks, uh, the diligent uh, few have shown up. I think we've got plenty of seats down front here. If you'd like to come on down here, <laughs> we can make this much more, uh, much more informal. Um, the party must have been really, really good last night. <laughs> but regardless, 8 o'clock is the hardest time in the world to, uh, to speak. And uh, nobody laughs at your jokes. But since we got such a small crowd, I'm going to tell a quick one anyway. It was this, um, this old farmer uh, down in Texas and a very small town had a, uh, a new preacher came to town. The new preacher was having his first sermon and he was very, very uh, nervous about that sermon. And uh, he shows up, and he's prepared, and he walks into the church, and it looks about like this. There was one old farmer there. The old farmer showed up. And the preacher was uh, scratching his head, and he waited a few minutes. He said, I don't, I don't know uh, whether I should go ahead and, uh, and uh, give my sermon or not. He said, uh, there's just nobody showed up. The word didn't get out. And the old farmer says, well, son, Tell you the way I do it. it. Says when I go out to feed my cows, I take a, I take a truckload of hay, and if one cow shows up, I feed her. And uh, that inspired the preacher. And then the preacher uh, commenced his sermon, and he went on for about two hours. And he was all worked up. And they went on and he asked the farmer, "Well, how did you like my, uh, my, my sermon? Did it do okay?" He said, "Son." I said, if one cow shows up, I go down there and feed her. I didn't say I gave her the whole load. Saying you don't like jokes either this time of day. I knew better than that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, just a quick introduction to myself. I am uh, Hort Tipton. As the slide says, I'm the executive director of the ISC Squared. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, for an extended painful period of time, I was the uh, chief information officer for the uh, Department of Interior and Government. Um, large operation, a lot, a lot of people know about it here, but uh, from there I managed IT operations uh, for about 80,000 people and 2,500 offices all over the world. So it's, um, it was quite a challenge. Uh, we had about a $1.5 billion IT budget, um, and it was never enough money to go around, but we always griped about that, but uh, it was a challenging job. Before that, I was a chemical engineer, which is my formal training with uh, Union Carbide. Um, but I'm enjoying this job, and today I wanted to, uh, to just take a quick uh, snapshot. Um, how many of you are, are just uh, are, are code developers? Uh, one, two, okay. How many of you are in some other uh, function of IT? Uh, okay, got a good, quite a good split there. All right, I can, I can talk both ways then. Um, today we're going to talk about software development, and uh, we call it the last security frontier. We want to approach it from uh, two different angles, and uh, I'm not diminishing anybody's role anywhere. I'm trying to explain what we're going to say in a, in a manner that integrates uh, the roles and appreciates the functions of individuals, but also from the synergistic value of a whole. Um, and I think I can get through this with outside of 45 minutes with no problem. Uh, just a quick uh, snapshot of uh, ISC Squared and the organization so you understand some of where I'm coming from with this. Um, so we're, we'll be celebrating a 20-year anniversary uh, next year, uh, so we're still a young organization. Uh, 60,000 certified uh, professionals in 135 countries, so we are worldwide. Uh, okay, all right. All right. <laughs> um, we have a board of directors, 13 people, uh, very, very renowned individuals, uh, most chief security officers in, um, in major corporations in the, in the country. Uh, and just a, a reminder that 70%, uh, according to Gardner, of our security vulnerabilities exist at the application layer. Uh, we've been um, very, very good, very persistent about uh, attacking the perimeter security, but um, 
just guarding the perimeter, as all of you know, is no longer, it's no longer sufficient. Data, data compromise is indeed the issue. And as long as we've got port 80 open, and as long as we've got email, uh, there'll, there'll always be a gate, and I don't care how many of the others that we close. And we're all reminded that uh, data loss, data breaches are not popular. Uh, individuals take them personally when they are hit. And as a result of that, 38 out of 50 states in the US have now enacted breach disclosure laws. Quite honestly, I think they, uh, they have, uh, I think we have experienced breaches to the extent and to the magnitude uh, that the impact that they make anymore as a, uh, as a whole and on a company is, um, is become diminished. It's become diminished because people, I think, are getting a bit complacent about it and are starting to accept it. And in a way, to me, that makes the, uh, the overall danger even, even worse than, than what it is. OK. Um, Frost and, and Sullivan uh, did some research for us. And then they found there are three primary conditions that create information security vulnerabilities in enterprise software applications. I'll, be, I'll fess up here. Actually, I think they found two, and I added one in there because I thought it needed to be there. <laughs> uh, the review indicated that inexperienced developers writing code, are they're human. And uh, without that experience, uh, mistakes are made. Things are overlooked, and they get better as they get experience, but everybody has to start somewhere. Uh, nobody hits the ground running, um, so you have to expect that, and you have to have the right place in the, uh, in the life to, in the development cycle uh, for that team. And then we have experienced developers writing code with inadequate training in the best practices for security. Um, I was reading on a train coming up from, uh, from Washington that some companies have looked at this and have taken a, I think a, well, it's an unusual approach in that, uh, I, I call it the gray beard approach, that they're, they're hiring first and foremost um, older developers uh, that know security. They've had security uh, mistakes. They've been burned like I have and uh, they have experience writing code. And quite frankly, I guess they're just a little independent and they're gonna put security in there, uh, whether the influencers and the management team uh, wants to pay for it or not. Uh, so they think that's a good thing. And then from there, then they can train and mentor uh, the more in, the, uh, or lesser experienced developers as they come in. This is just a quick reminder slide. Uh, everybody remembers these three rascals and the damage and the confusion and the, and the mess that, uh, that they called. Um, you probably have noticed in recent days we really haven't seen this, these type of academic epidemics. Um, at least you haven't seen them uh, publicized. Uh, I can assure you from uh, even the classified side of the world, they still go on. Um, they've become more stealthy. Uh, we have them, we don't even know it. That, and, and that is one of the more, more scary pieces of this. Um, by switching from people having, uh, getting kicks out of messing with your websites and uh, doing the DOS attacks, DDoS attacks on you, of course, it's more now in, the people are in it for financial gain. So it's, we say it's mafia driven. There's a lot of the crime element, uh, the financial institution is being hit. And when they are hit, guess what? They don't like to tell you about it. It's an embarrassment. They don't want their customers uh, alerted. And uh, right, as the way things are going for banks and companies today, the least attention that they can get, uh, the better off that they are. So they're still there. They're, they're just hiding in a, a different, different form. Data, the next frontier. I've been preaching data for about five years. You know, it's, stop and think about it. It's all about the data. If you start the data, the lifeblood of any organization or of any system or application, 
that's the thing that keeps you going. That's what you sell. That's data about what you have. Um, so you have to have a handle on that. It's your most critical asset. So no matter how it's defined, personal identifiable data, uh, intellectual property, privacy, it all needs to be protected in its own particular way. And that's where the difficulty uh, comes in. One size does not fit all. In the government, we had classifications of uh, about 53 different kinds of PI, as we called it. And uh, each of those had to be categorized, tagged, and uh, appropriately, appropriately filed. So when we write our software, we, we should know at least what it's intended to protect. Uh, there should be the connections between the people that are going to be using that. How important is the data? We create almost two exabytes of data a year, and it's doubling every 12 months. Uh, now, maybe 80% of that is spam, but it's still out there. Somebody still has to, uh, to deal with it. So the real question is, what are we going to do with all that stuff? Where are you going to get the people to sort it, categorize it, determine how important it is, which part of it needs to be in which layer of your database? and just how much access do you allow to that. Uh, it's, if you're looking at that from the eyes of, uh, of uh, uh, just the individual coder, it's certainly, in my opinion, unfair to expect them to know or read your mind about what it is you're trying to, uh, to accomplish with that without an exhaustive amount of information interchange on it. It's estimated that a record lost um, in U.S. dollars, it's somewhere between 50 and 200. Uh, I won't stand here and try to defend that number. Uh, if you do the math on T.J. Maxx's loss, for example, you'll find out that that, that loss should have cost them in the billions of dollars. Well, it really didn't. It, I think it cost them uh, at least what was reported about 215 million dollars. I mean, a mere 215 million dollars, right? Pocket change. We experienced in the government the loss of, um, of an item, uh, the infamous uh, Veterans Administration laptop. Everybody heard about that? Yep. How many of you are veterans and got a letter from the VA? <laughs> right. Thank you, sir. Um, fortunately, that laptop was found, um, and there, there was no evidence that there was any breach on, the, uh, on that laptop. But what would you think it cost the Veterans Administration just in losing that laptop with not a single person breach, no identity loss? It's $126 million. When you send 26 million letters to veterans, take the postage. And just as a simple example, uh, there was a requirement to provide, uh, what do you call it, identity monitoring, credit monitoring reports. It costs you about $29.95. Uh, do the math and it starts multiplying up. And companies are under that, under that same burden. So you don't have to actually be exploited um, in order to, to cost you money. But who pays for that? Do software companies pay for that? Well, in that particular case, they couldn't help losing the laptop. Uh, they couldn't help that the guy didn't encrypt it. Uh, so their software was really not maintained or managed in a, in a secure fashion. So, but a lot of times they get the blame and the credit for that. So we say weaknesses in software is like weaknesses, or, or like the weakness in a lock on a safe. Um, that lock depends on how big it is. I mean, how big a lock do you want to put on, uh, on your data. How important is the data determines how, what the size of that lock. And then there are indirect weaknesses as well. Um, I keep thinking of, um, in, uh, I'm sure this happened in New York, in, in Washington, the, uh, the parking meter uh, issues. People will figure out how to steal just about anything. Um, it, the thieves would wait until dark, of course, and you think a parking meter is safe. How are you going to get the quarters out of there, really? Well, they take a pipe cutter, go around and just cut the heads off of the meters, pull them in the back of the truck, and they just about wiped out 
the parking meters in uh, in uh, in DC, uh, and I suspect most large cities run into that same same problem. So now all you see in many places are just these little steel stumps and <laughs> conduits. Comical in a way. Uh, the insider threat. Fifty-one percent of employers believe that their internal employees are the biggest threat to their information. Um, I've seen uh, estimates that it's even larger than that. I've seen it as high as 70%. Uh, so what's that got to do with software? Uh, how can software help that? Um, how, how do insiders get into the information? Good software, uh, if, if, it's, if it's thought through, will have ways of telling who has been into the data, who offloaded it, who put it on a thumb drive. Uh, they'll have logs that if we use them, uh, and if those logs are, uh, are, are turned on, uh, and if we have people who know how to read them, uh, we can tell who those insiders are in many cases in doing that. Just an example of uh, just internal checks and balances that, uh, that can go on that. Um, the financial loss, the reputational damage, uh, in play, I mean, you guys know all of the, uh, all of the downsides and all of the, uh, the embarrassment that comes by being exploited um, and, and losing someone's data. If, if you notice the articles, the articles in the media just loves to pound on the, it's the personal, it's how it affects the individual, uh, the person who's about to, uh, to have their credit cards and social security numbers distributed and sold in packages over the internet whether exploited or not. Now this is, a, the last point is, is one I, I found, I think it came from a, a Fortify white paper, uh, but estimated that 88% of disgruntled IT employers were high risk for data theft or destruction. That is an astounding number. So I guess what that means is don't tick off your network administrator. Look what happened in San Francisco. Now, if you stop and think, I bet any one of you in here could figure out how to have avoided that San Francisco situation. And some of it could have been in, uh, in, the, in the software end of it. Uh, some of it could have been in management, uh, control, access, uh, uh, division of duties, and, and those type of techniques. But those things generally cost additional money. And in tight budgets, uh, your software is going to have to uh, take people out of it as much as it possibly can, and it's going to have to build in those checks and balances because there's not going to be people to share all those duties with in many cases. How many of you have you, have you ever heard of the uh, enforced vacation policy? Yes, sir. Good. Um, smart companies will re require key employees, uh, employees setting on critical assets like that, to actually take a vacation and while they're gone if they have the resources again they will do a complete review of the uh, of the records and the files of that particular individual see, just to make sure that uh, that they've got a second set of eyes on that um, and I'm thinking well in today's economic times companies are laying off people companies are getting acquired there is fear there's disruption all this is out there and IT people are affected uh, just like anybody else. But it's not just IT people that can stick a thumb drive in a computer and offload data. Just about anybody can do that if you don't have, to have port control uh, on that. So you wonder what, how a, a situation should be handled. I mean, it, it's, it's almost brutal. I've seen people when they, when they retire or when they get laid off, uh, an HR person and an IT person shows up at their desk, uh, a lot of times they don't even know it. Uh, give me your tokens, give me uh, your keys, uh, you're cut off from all contact, here's the door. Take their files and leave them out. And you know, it's not nothing personal, <laughs> but it sure feels personal uh, when you have to operate like that. But that, unfortunately, that's, that's what we've come to in many cases. Uh, just a variety of perspectives. Um, of people that are involved in, in the software development. I think this takes, and just to show some of the things that, that, are, that are considered in there, uh, our organizational stakeholders, the business, we say, versus the information technology. 
um, as, as CIO, I mean, my biggest job was making sure that the business people could talk to the developers, to the IT people, and take the time to explain what it really was that they wanted. Um, because 99 times out of 100, the business people will come to uh, the, uh, the IT department, the application shop, and, well, we've got legacy systems we want to modernize. Well, what do you want to modernize? Well, I got a hundred uh, little financial systems. I want one financial system. Well, how are you going to do finances? Just the way we did it the last 25 years. It worked good then, works good now. Not necessarily true. So you're then put in a position of programming something that is an antiquated practice that comes out uh, not exactly the way they wanted. Who gets who gets the blame for it? Faulty software. You know, you paved the cow path, and instead of re-engineering the business process to make it more efficient, uh, you, you, you don't get the, uh, the return from the software that, you, that was really expected. And there are all sorts of uh, development models, as everybody knows. Uh, the old waterfalls, your spirals, uh, the agiles, the reds, uh, there's all sorts of different ways uh, that require different techniques, uh, particularly when you're adding security uh, to that. Growth of the internet, well, that's an understatement. Um, it's estimated that 50% of uh, the threats uh, in the security world at this point uh, stem from the internet. And just practically everything that, uh, that I'm aware of, particularly the big business, I mean, their business is all done out there on the web. Um, and now we add on top of that, We've got web too. People love to collaborate. Uh, they're going to do it. Uh, people are creative. And a lot of times they do things that are outside of your accepted uh, architecture. And we can't take that away from them. I mean, that, that is the growth. That's why we have connectivity. That's why people rely on high degree of connectivity. That's why they demand high bandwidth so they can load lots of stuff. Uh, we are accustomed to being a, an information sharing society. We want our stuff out there. It's availability. That's, uh, that's part of our job. Protecting it while making it available is the tricky part. Uh, when I first started in, in Interior at CIO, half of the uh, and the interior, by the way, has the Park Service, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Park Service, uh, Fish and Wildlife, USGS, the Geological Survey, a lot of really fascinating groups. Half of them had firewalls, the other half had nothing. Uh, they put, and this is only like six years ago, six, seven years ago. So they put, whoa, <laughs> they, put, uh, they put up everything. Um, my biggest problems were the, uh, were the scientists the researchers. They left to put the papers out. They had to communicate with, with Russian scientists. They wanted unfettered access to the internet. And that's a, that's a quote from a guy that I, I had tried to put some controls on. Um, and the connectivity, they want it fast. They also, they're not quite as impatient as my wife, but it's close. Um, I built her a real nice computer. It's really, really fast, but it's only as fast as the server will feed it. And she likes to run several things at once. She'll punch a button, and while the little hourglass is up there, she's, if it goes past a couple of seconds, she's tapping another button. And she'll have three taps before uh, the, the hourglass gets a chance to give her what she wants. And she's only downloading a 50 meg file, of course. Um, and then wonders why her software is locked up and the computer's out. Patience. We've come to depend upon it. So. We have to build security into, uh, into the architectures and into the applications at the very earliest stage. Um, we're all plagued with legacy systems, so we know we have to do what we can to make those internal applications as safe as we can. Some of them uh, cannot, uh, uh, cannot have or cannot stand good, strong uh, security measures, so we, we, we 
band-aid those with uh, application firewalls and other devices. Uh, we just basically encapsulate them. Uh, but we all are going through the phase of what we call modernization, and it's taking these old legacy systems and bringing them into more modern operations, hopefully re-engineered, going through basic sound uh, processes for, uh, for the producing that software. But if you don't put your security in on the front end, it's estimated uh, that a bolt-on is 30 to 100 times more expensive than if you do it right the first time. Look at it like this. We approach it from a life cycle approach. If you're thinking about security at the conceptual stage, when that idea first comes up, we're going to build a system. Describe what the system is going to do. You start collecting requirements. You get over to design. Next thing you know, you've got a project. Now, what happens when you get a project? When you get a project, you get a project manager. The project manager has a charge. He has a budget. That budget is locked down. His schedule is rigid. And he pushes a button on his project management software that says baseline. And from that point, everything's measured against the baseline. Oh, here comes the security guy and you know did you put this particular security uh, module into the software uh, we need to build that in how often do they listen to you do they get lip service do they push the they close the door and I don't work for you buddy uh, you're too late you should have been here last month uh, this this is decided it's done uh, go, <laughs> go see the big boss <laughs> so you, you, you have built-in turmoil right at the front if you don't get that foot in the door early. So currently, we, we ask ourselves, why is security missing? Uh, lack of time, uh, impatience, uh, rush to market, expense. Um, sometimes it can slow down the application. Uh, most cases, you won't even notice it. but. Uh, a lot of us are perfectionists, and uh, we don't want anything messing with, uh, with speed. I, I know those network guys are like that. They want everything whizzing through that network. And um, encryption is not their friend in, <laughs> in many cases. They can't, they can't see what's going on in, uh, in a lot of those instances. And there's limited personnel. Uh, the rush to market. Uh, I always had more calls for, uh, for meetings and, and, and visits from companies the last two weeks of each quarter. And you know what happens those last two weeks. Uh, that's when the sales quotas uh, come to bear. And then the lack of awareness and the, the actual value of security. Uh, people generally don't uh, feel the pain, let's say, of security by reading about it. They feel about it when their computer gets hacked. They get uh, into, a, in, into a mess of trying to, to clean that up or their social security number gets leaked or credit cards out, and they get a call from the bank. Or, yeah, I, guess, I get a call from the bank. I get about a call maybe once every two weeks, just checking, you know. Uh, I think the last one was from my wife when she was in uh, Scotland. And uh, she had run up quite a, quite a lot of money on her credit card. She likes to shop. So they called me, and they said, uh, Got a, got a charge here for, uh, I don't know, seven or eight hundred dollars on on, a, on the Visa card. Um, is that authorized? I said, well, I thought a minute. I said, well, I guess so. But when I got that second call, <laughs> I said, nah, you better cut her off. <laughs> as long as she had enough to get home with. <laughs> so it's, uh, the message, I guess, is it's not just about writing uh, secure code. Uh, it has to be a convergence of the things we have listed here. Uh, the basic security principles, policy, process, and people are key with, uh, with all, of, uh, all the folks in the security space. So your policy has got to be pertinent and enforceable. Uh, your software is no good if people don't enforce the, the use and the configuration of it. When it's deployed, um, I, had to, I had to change interior because everything was deployed with, uh, and the default position was open. Because that made it easy. Nobody was calling from the user at the help desk, I can't get to a certain 
uh, sciatic can't get to a certain port. Nobody really asked him, well, why do you need to go there? Uh, it was, it took less people to manage. You plug the firewall in and, and uh, it's open and, and they go. Also, at the same time, everybody had administrative rights. So they could download any piece of software they wanted off of the net uh, on those desktops. Next thing you know, you got a, you got a real mess. So I have found in the uh, CIO world and the security world, we're in this constant position of having to say no. And we're saying no to people and we're trying to change cultures. And we're expecting uh, our software developers to help us out of that box a bit by making it, uh, maybe it is a little less user friendly, but at the same time, it'll be more secure by asking more pertinent questions, helping determine who has access to go to the places uh, and who does not. So we've got to, we have got to tighten that up. And then I just mentioned the last point. Um, it does come down to the people. And right now we get more mistakes uh, are made by people. And most of them are inadvertent. Most of them uh, are unintentional. But the, but the uh, end result and the impact is, uh, is the same. People are human and humans make errors. These are the drivers. It can permanent damage uh, your company. I know a couple of companies that went out of business uh, just, just because of it. Um, erosion of brand, reputation, investigators and litigation. I can tell a long story about that, but I won't. I'll, I will simply say that a federal judge shut down the Department of Interior in 2001. All 80,000 people with a federal court order shut off the internet. The first day, the managers thought that was, that was uh, kind of funny. They said, well, maybe get some work out of people. They'll, they'll not be surfing the internet today. But by Friday, they were in my office asking, um, are we going to get paid? And the answer was, well, no, you're not. You're not going to get paid this week. We didn't have a point-to-point -point connection. Uh, it was... It was certain, certain pieces of it were internet based. The, the time and attendance and things were not, uh, they were not designed that way. So until we could actually set up a point to point connection and get off of the internet for that piece uh, and 253 other workarounds um, took just uh, actually last year, uh, did all of Interior get reconnected to the internet? That was seven years. So imagine the pain from that. So secure software is designed with security in mind. It's designed, developed with security controls. And it's software that is protected throughout its life cycle. And I don't think we often think about that. I mentioned the concept. Uh, I'll mention the disposal piece. Uh, it has to be disposed of properly. How many times have you read uh, responsible companies? Uh, when they're upgrading computers, they donate their computers or they sell them on eBay and the servers, and what do you got? You got data on them. You got applications on them. You have things on there that, uh, that you really should have wiped. Have you archived the records off of them? Have you sanitized the records that, uh, that are on there not saving data that you really don't need to be uh, to be saving. And then there's the, the middle part. You buy software, it's configured, it could be perfect. You get it and you get it deployed and hopefully you get it configured correctly when it's deployed and then all of a sudden the freeze is off, it's in production and somebody comes in, got this great uh, new piece of functionality we've got to add to this software and they'll want to start customizing it. Who leads the customization? You, you don't get that same development team that originally developed that software. You've got a new group that's coming in and going to be uh, making your changes for you. How do you control that? How do you know that those people uh, actually have a full grasp of what those changes mean? Same thing with patches. You put patches on one place and somewhere else you break, you break, a, you break the application in other ways. So it's about migrating and controlling direct and indirect risk of these software vulnerabilities and the maintenance of that software from start to finish. That, that's, that's our theory. So what's next? 
building soft, secure, uh, software along with secure code, and it's necessary now. The problems are getting worse each day. There's a whole uh, kaleidoscope of perspectives to be factored into the development, not just how good you are on writing code. We know you can do that. And then the first line of defense as a qualified, educated people that know how to do it, <clears throat> meet the requirements, including design, testing, deployment, and ultimately disposal of that, uh, of that software. This is a, um, a picture that, uh, that we've looked at of some existing uh, uh, certification programs that are out there that are attempting to, uh, uh, to not only certify but to train in particular specific areas. Um, we find most of these are, um, are technical uh, type of credentials and programs, which is well and good. They've, uh, they've done a, a good job on that. But um, we've, we've been concerned about the integration of all of these different pieces. How do, how do all of these come together? I mean, where's the individual, uh, let's say the lead person, not the programmer, not the manager, but where is the lead person that assures that all of these pieces are in place and that uh, can ask those questions. They don't necessarily have to be experts in any of these areas uh, that you see up here, um, but they do know enough uh, about all of the areas to ask the, uh, the right questions and um, they need to have enough authority that if something needs to be corrected at any point within that life cycle, then they know they can do that. So that's the area that we look at that needs filling. Um, I think that's, let's see, I've got three minutes. Oops, that was an advertisement. I'm not supposed to show that, but I'll leave it there anyway. <laughs> um, at this point, uh, are, there, are there any questions from the audience? I think we can take questions. How was the party? Anybody come to our party last night? Our launch party? Yeah. Hope you had a good time. Hope you had a good time. <laughs> well, with that, I thank you for your attention. And it's been a pleasure visiting, and uh, our thanks to OWASP for, uh, for allowing ISC Squared to share some thoughts with you. Thank you.